want to bring in now our guest analyst at this time, former police officer and law enforcement analyst Mark Powell joining us in San Diego, California. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Mark. So right off the bat, uh, we've heard some really powerful testimony, including from a police officer. You, obviously, you have that background as well. But just kind of overall, big picture, uh, who do you think had more kind of powerful witnesses and, and more convincing evidence? Both sides had very good witnesses. I think when you're listening to the testimony, the police officer had some of the strongest testimony because what you'll find out is if a police officer yeah. reports to the scene of a domestic violence call and they notice signs of domestic violence, they will make an arrest. They will probably have sent out a warrant or something for Johnny to, to, to make the arrest. However, they found no evidence of domestic violence and they look and there was a female officer on there and they look to see are there any bruises, are there any marks, or is there any disheveled room? They found nothing during that investigation. So the question is, did domestic violence actually occur? We know that she's made comments about a bruise kit and things like that. So did this actually occur? Because this is kind of the crux of it. Was she abused and if she was abused, was that article that she wrote intended to help women or was that article intended to damage Johnny? Yeah, and ahead, we're gonna actually play uh, some of that testimony from the police officer and take a deeper look at that. Uh, but you, you know, you touched on one of the central arguments uh, that's being made by Amber Heard's team, which is, you know, if you do find any instance of abuse, whether it is sexual, whether it's any kind of physical or even emotional abuse, uh, then Heard should be the winner here. Uh, let's go ahead and play that clip from Ben Rottenborn. If you believe that Depp was abusive to Amber one time ever in any of the various forms of abuse, not only physical, verbal, emotional, psychological, sexual, any of the ways of abuse, then your job is very easy. And you can not only deny Mr. Depp's claim, but you can find for Amber on her counterclaim. And it's interesting that Ms. Vasquez just changed their theory after six weeks. She said, oh, well, domestic abuse just means physical abuse. It's not what Mr. Depp said. It's not what Dr. Curry said. It's not what Dr. Hughes said. It's not what you know to be true. You know that the evidence that you've seen constitutes all sorts of abuse. And there's a reason that they're running as fast as they can from those sorts of abuse because they know that he did it. Now the suggestion that Amber's abuse allegations are a hoax is vicious and vile. Mr. Depp can say whatever he wants now, but he can't say change the evidence that you've seen at the trial. And the evidence shows that Ms. Heard did not commit abuse hoaxes, not about sexual violence, not about May 21st, 2016, and certainly not about Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman's catch-all, all-purpose statement that Ms. Heard's abuse hoax, which suggests that every one of her allegations are false, that that's coming to an end. The evidence shows she did not commit any of those hoaxes. The evidence shows that she was abused exactly how not only she, but her witnesses supporting her claims say that she was. And their witnesses even, who claim that Mr. Depp abused her. Um, so Mr. Powell, is Mr. Rottenborn right? Did they actually show that Amber Heard was abused by Johnny Depp in some way, even if it's emotional? Well, it, from a law enforcement standpoint, if somebody calls law enforcement and says, my spouse, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, whichever side says, they've been yelling at me, they've been saying very nasty things to me, and I feel that I'm hurt, my feelings are hurt, it's affectingly emotionally, that's not a crime. They're not gonna make an arrest. They're gonna make an arrest if there's domestic violence, where there's in fact, physical violence, if the person is being confronted um, in, in a sexually violently or being confronted physically violently, and there has to be some signs of that. But merely saying that he or she said some awful things to me that made me feel bad, I, I'm not sure if the jury is going to buy one side or the other because apparently there were heated conversations and arguments going both ways and both sides were probably saying things um, that were not nice or, or cruel in fact to each other.
Okay, I want to bring in now at this point uh, attorney C.K. Hoffler uh, joining us as a guest analyst once again. So uh, Ms. Hoffler, just for our viewers, is a, a trial attorney, former president of the National um, Bar Association as well. Um, so I want to ask your take on this. Did Is Mr. Rottenborn right? I mean, if, if you find one instance of abuse in any form or fashion, even emotional abuse, that you have to find for Ms. Heard. And did they actually show that there was such abuse? Um, no, I don't think he's correct. I do, I agree that you have to draw a distinction between physical abuse, because the question here is was Johnny Depp a wife beater? Because that is really the implication, the allegation from the written article. Did he physically abuse Amber Heard? There's a lot of evidence that Amber Heard physically abused Johnny Depp. But the question here for him to prevail is did he physically abuse her? And there has been Amber Heard's testimony corroborated by her sister. And, I, and so I think that there's some evidence, but I think that the jury could easily discount Amber's testimony on that because there's conflicting evidence. Where there's not conflicting evidence and where the jury heard from Amber's own mouth is Amber hitting Johnny. So it sounds like on the physical abuse that what really happened is Amber was the one who was physically abusive. Johnny may have been emotionally abusive, he may have thrown things, but he, there's no evidence other than from Amber and her sister, and they are questionable witnesses in terms of credibility, that there's any allegation from people who were there at the same incident that Johnny physically abused her. So I think that the lawyer is wrong. I don't think emo this case is about emotional abuse, because if it were about emotional abuse, both of them would lose. So I don't think that he is correct in that assertion, and I think he's gonna get in trouble with the jury, because I don't think that is consistent with the jury instructions or the evidence that the jury's that the jury saw and heard. And, and you sound like Depp's attorney, uh, you know, Benjamin Chu, who also essentially argues this is like trying to claim Me Too without an, an actual basis for it. Um, let's listen to that clip from Closing Arguments. Before Amber Heard, ladies and gentlemen, no woman ever, no woman ever before Amber Heard ever claimed that Mr. Depp raised a hand to her in his 58 years, and no other woman since Ms. Heard made that false claim back on May 17th, May 27th, 2016, has and repeated it in her December 2018 op-ed, has any woman come forward since? This is Me Too without any Me Too. Um, so CK, what do you think of that statement? And, and I wanna also ask you even further than that, do you think that if in fact these claims are false that it's very damaging to the Me Too movement? I do think it can be damaging to the Me Too movement if these claims are false. Look, I'm an advocate for women, I'm an advocate for children, I'm an advocate for victims. But I do take exception when there are allegations that are this strong, this severe, that can literally destroy someone's career and reputation that are not substantiated by facts. When police are called to the scene of an alleged domestic violence, typically they're going to arrest someone when there's a scintilla of evidence. There was no evidence found of these of these out that support these allegations. And again, we're down to Amber's word and her sister's word. And so I think that it does damage the Me Too movement. It does damage the cause of women who really, really are victims and, and face life-threatening circumstances. And it's very unfortunate. Now, if the I don't know what happened, but I'm just looking at the evidence like everyone else. And I don't think that there's sufficient credible evidence that Amber Heard was physically abused by Johnny Depp. Did they have a tumultuous, toxic relationship? Absolutely. Did they emotionally abuse each other? Absolutely, but that's not the question. It's the physical abuse. Did he physically abuse her? And when he made the statement, I've never physically abused a woman, and then you've got Ellen Barkin who says, no, he didn't physically abuse her. And you've got Kate Moss that said, that's a lie. He never physically abused me. That severely impacts Amber Heard's credibility and her sister, by connection, by definition, because her sister has a lot of bias and reasons to support her sister's claim. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's quite damaging and I do think it's very unfortunate.
Mm, all right, thank you so much. Trial attorney C.K. Hoffler, law enforcement analyst Mark Powell joining us. Okay, want to bring back in our guest analyst for this hour, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta, former police officer and law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. Um, so Mark, I want to start with you because uh, you know kind of police protocol and procedure very well. Um, this line of questioning by Elaine uh, Bredhoff, the attorney for Amber Heard, do you think it was effective? Do you think that uh, there were some credibility issues that she uncovered about the, how the investigation was was conducted. Joy, she she was a very very good at cross examining the police officer, but the police officer did an excellent job. But I just want to let the viewers know when an officer reports to a domestic violence call, these are the most dangerous calls that they oftentimes have to go on. He doesn't know if there's somebody hiding in the bedroom. He doesn't know if there's weapons involved. He has no idea of what's going on in there. So it's it's very stressful. So when he's walking into the apartment, he's not only looking to see if everything is in order or if anything is disheveled. He's also looking to make sure he's not being ambushed if somebody's gonna come out and attack him. Because you never know in a domestic violence call, more officers are injured in domestic violence calls and most other calls. But when he when he did come in there and he did speak to the the the, the victim or Amber and, and the witnesses in there, the fact that they were so uncooperative and not seeking medical attention says a lot to everybody that that maybe nothing happened. His determination was nothing happened. And when they make that determination, and they look closely, but if they make that determination, there was no arrest. In fact, in some of the other testimony, it appears that Johnny Depp was the victim of domestic violence when he was assaulted with an alcohol bottle, but yet did not say that bottle was thrown at him. He sustained great bodily injury. If he would have said that bottle was thrown at me, it would have been heard that would have been the one charged with domestic violence. This case would be a very different case if that were to have occurred back then. Yeah, so CK, it's really interesting. I mean, because on one hand, you know, the officers are saying they didn't find any evidence of, you know, d domestic violence here. But on the other hand, you just heard this officer during cross examination say, well, I wasn't there when the alleged incident happened. So I'm not sure that I'm in the position to, to testify whether it happened either way, is essentially what he said. So what do you make, I mean, of this? Is it, is it a win for Depp or for Heard? I think in, in the final analysis is a win for Depp because what we saw was the testimony, but there's a different context. No one is ever there. None of the officers would ever be there. So, so they would never know with certainty whether it happened or not. When they're coming on a scene after the fact, they have to look at the evidence, which is what they did. So I thought he he testified honestly under oath. I, he probably said something like, you know, of course I was not there to see or to witness. But when I got to the scene, I looked at the evidence and I saw no evidence of violence by Johnny Hurd against Am, uh, by Johnny Depp against Amber Heard. So I think in the final analysis, this is a victory for Johnny Depp, but this is messy. Let's just be honest, this is messy. And but and so through all the mess, the jury's gotta sift through all the mess and make a determination first, whether there's any evidence, credible evidence that Johnny Depp physically abused Amber Heard. And based on what we're seeing in the testimony, the way that it came out of trial, I don't think that there's any still any evidence of that because I think the jury is going to discount Amber Heard's testimony and her sister's testimony on that point. Mm, and, and we also heard from a, a female officer responding who said she didn't view Amber Heard as a victim of domestic violence. Let's listen, listen to that. Did you provide a copy of this pamphlet to Amber Heard? I did not. I did not identify her as a victim of domestic violence. We met with the victim. We checked the location. Uh, the husband wasn't there, and that the victim advised us that she just had an argument and that she wasn't going to give us any further information. And because we didn't identify a crime, we issued her a business card, letting her know that she could reach out to us later if she changed her mind and wanted to cooperate. So your best recollection is that you saw no injuries on Amber Heard, correct? Correct. And I'm gonna ask you to take a look at that eyelid. Is it your perception that that eyelid does not reflect an injury? I'm sorry, what was your answer? Correct, no injury. All right, uh, final reaction to, to that before we move on. Mark, what do you think? 
Well, if the officers investigated, Joy, if they investigated and they found no signs of domestic violence or no signs of abuse, you have to think to yourself, why was a call being made if there's an accusation of domestic violence? Why would somebody call and say, I'm under some type of attack, I'm a victim of domestic violence or somebody other than the victim call and, and say that? If police officers get there, they find no signs of disheveled apartment, they find no signs of domestic violence. So you have to think, why does somebody make that phone call to law enforcement to bring them out there claim some domestic violence uh, accusation and the officers get out there and find nothing and then the witnesses are completely uncooperative. Who's uncooperative when they actually call the police and the police get there and they say, well, we don't really want to talk to you. Everything is fine, uh, You know, go about your own business. And when you have three police officers, not just one, all saying the same thing, hey, we didn't see any signs of domestic violence. I think it's a very strong case that that maybe something didn't happen. Like, like the attorney said, the, no officer is there witnessing the domestic violence. You have to go in there and gather evidence. And the evidence did not support making arrest for domestic violence at that time. All right, thank you so much, Mark Powell and C.K. Hoffler. We're gonna hopefully uh, get more analysis from you ahead. Still with us, our guest analyst for this hour, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta, former police officer and law enforcement analyst, Mark Powell in San Diego, California. So C.K., you know, given that this jury skews younger, predominantly under the age of 40, um, do you think that there are kind of changing attitudes that might impact how they view Johnny Depp's addiction? Might they be sympathetic to that? You know, I think that's a, that's an excellent question to ask. I do think younger folk, you know, they've been exposed to so many different types of drugs. You know, marijuana is legal um, for in most jurisdictions, and and so I think younger folks are much less likely to judge and to be have a negative perception when it comes to addiction because they've seen so much in their lifetime. You know, imagine there there are things that are legal like vaping and things that in the past, um, you know. Uh, would not have been perceived as being legal or acceptable. So I think that that will bode well for Johnny Depp. The one thing that I think helps him is he came out in direct examination and talked about his abuse. But the fact that there's not a single other woman in his life other than Amber that can point to when he is doing drugs, when he's drinking alcohol, when he's in that state has physically abused him is probably the most important and powerful statement that he can make because he's been abusing drugs since he was a teenager. And if he were prone to violence against women, it would have manifested itself before Amber Heard allegedly, um, before that time. So I think that the jurors are going to be somewhat sympathetic to him because he came out on direct examination and openly, candidly talked about his addiction. And you mentioned Amber Heard describing um, his drug induced state or states. Actually, let's listen to a clip of some of that testimony. Eventually it get bored and then I'd see him drinking again. Um, when I started to get upset, noticing the pattern um, of the violence going with the, the drinking and drugs, then I, then he started sneaking it. So it became less clear and I'd have to look for clues as to what he was on. So I just knew how to react, you know? Uh, Johnny on speed is very different from Johnny on opiates. Uh, Johnny on opiates, very different from <sighs> Adderall and, 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 and cocaine Johnny, which is very different from Quaaludes Johnny. But I, I had to get good at paying attention to the different versions of him. Mark, given your law enforcement background, I imagine that you, you have some understanding of just kind of how different drugs can, can impact um, the individual taking them. Is what she's saying credible? Well, what she's saying is very interesting and it, it may be credible. That's going to be up to the jury to decide. But what this is touching upon is a much larger issue. Sometimes some of these cases can bring up much larger issues. And they're talking about student mental health because as Johnny Depp said, as a child, he was dealing with anxiety, depression, stress. So that child decided to self-medicate and seeing that there were no other resources probably available to him, he started using drugs as a way to cope with this anxiety. He didn't go to a psychologist, didn't go to a psychiatrist, maybe he did at some point, but he decided to use 
um, medications that his mother was using to sell medicated and that and that became a problem in the future. Now, using the different drugs, for example, using uh, crystal meth or cocaine or, or quaaludes, all of these drugs are illegal. If somebody is under the influence of these drugs, they get arrested. If you purchase these drugs, you gotta think about that. You have to purchase them. Somebody have to sell them the drugs. So what we're looking at is a whole host of different types of misdemeanors and felony crimes being committed here as they go through with their testimony. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and that's certainly, you know, this is a defamation case, it's a civil case, but we are seeing several criminal law themes pop up here. Thank you so much, Mark Powell and C.K. Hoffler for joining us. Okay, still with us, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta, former police officer, law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. I mean, this guy just, I don't mean to inject my opinion, but he is so emotive, and he gets, he got me laughing in one moment, and the next moment I felt like I wanted to cry along with him. Do you think that the jury is going to feel the same way, CK? I do think so. You know, this is the kind of witness, he seems like a regular person. We have to remember that jurors are, are you know, regular people, everyday people like we all are. And so they're sitting and listening to this and seeing a grown man cry does have an impact on everybody. I mean, you just feel some kind of way. But the fact that he is um, a, a, not an actor, not anyone who's Hollywood prone, although he obviously is very close to Johnny. Johnny has helped him throughout his career. I think makes him endearing to the jury. And I think the jury probably felt the weight of emotion. He believes that this is Amber's behavior is insane. It's crazy. It's unfair. And he focuses on the impact and the ravages of what he perceives as lies that she's told and fraudulent behavior. I think that that's, that probably was very powerful for the jury. Primacy is key. So he was one of the first witnesses that testified on behalf of Johnny Depp in the beginning stages. And I think that may have laid the painted a picture. That was the canvas that was used to paint the picture of Amber Heard and her lies, and I think he probably did a very effective job at it. Now, the bias is, of course, he's a very close friend of, of, of Johnny Depp, and Johnny Depp has helped him tremendously, but I think he just seems like he's genuine, and he said he loved Amber Heard. He just thought what she was doing was wrong. That narrative can be very compelling for a jury, especially in a case like this. He actually threw in the word malicious, that she was her maliciousness, and one of the standards, because Johnny Depp is a, is a you know, and, and they're both public persons. So, you know, just did Amber Heard do this maliciously? And I think the malice probably does permeate throughout the case, but he's the first person, the first witness to actually use the word malice or malicious. So I think it was probably very impactful for the jury. Yeah, and certainly that is a legal element. Mark, we're running out of time, but real quick, what was your thought on that? Well, it brought up a lot of issues that are very serious, whether or not if somebody's going to report domestic violence, are they going to use it as a tool to hurt another person? And then the other, on the flip side of it is, if I do bring up a domestic violence call, am I going to be not credible? And people are not going to believe me. Two completely separate issues, very important when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to social issues. All right, thank you so much to both of you. Okay, joining us once again, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta and former police officer, law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. Um, so C.K., I mean, they're really getting into the nitty gritty now of the jury instructions, uh, looking at uh, basically did, did this team prove the elements of the claim here? Essentially, did Ms. Heard publish the statement? Was it false? Was it defamatory, et cetera, et cetera? Um, what do you think that means? Well, first of all, when you're a lawyer, and I've been in this position so many times, and the jury comes back with a question, literally you stop breathing because you, you, you just don't know what it means. And you can the question's gonna be interpreted anyway. I think what this means is this jury is very attentive. They're very analytical. They're drawing distinctions between the headline versus the text, the substance. That demonstrates a very analytical jury. They're going to look at every statement, which you need to have in a defamation case. Because you can have within an article, some defamatory statements, but the entire article may not be defamatory. So here, the question is about the headline, I think, this is probably very helpful for Johnny Depp on the one hand, because they are seeking to know, is it the headline or is it the entire article? The fact that the only thing that they have to show on this particular account is that the headline was the statement that was defamatory helps because it's just one headline. That's the first thing. The second thing, however, is it could be something that could hurt and, and be helpful for Amber Heard's case because they may be saying, well, 
because of the fact that she is testifying that she did not have anything to do with the headline, um, that there are other forces that created it, maybe she's not responsible for the headline. However, when you have articles that are put in, usually you get a, 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 a chance to look at the entire article, including headlines. I've worked a lot in this space. So chances are that she or her lawyer or someone saw the complete final article with headline and all before it was published. Why? Because she's a public figure and because they understand that if there's anything wrong, what's gonna happen is litigation just like it happened here. Mm, absolutely, uh, and Mark, you know, the fact that the jury asked a pretty sophisticated question, uh, the second day of deliberations today will be day three. Uh, do you think it means that they're close to reaching a verdict? Oh, absolutely, if they're asking questions of that detailed. But what we also know is that this entire case is surrounded around a crime or crimes. This entire case is surrounded by domestic violence allegations. If the domestic violence allegations are correct, I think that um, there, there'll be a case here, there'll be a verdict you know, that might go in, in her decision. If the case or the, the jury decides maybe uh, as domestic violence never occurred, I think it's gonna be a very, very hard call for them to determine whether or not uh, to rule in favor of one or the other. And, and they may be leaning towards death. But, because like I said, when the, when the title is written, it's written by the editor or the, the publication. It's not written by the person who authored the, the op-ed. So she really has no control over what the title says, but at no time did she discredit the title. There's allegations of abuse in there. This whole thing is an allegation of abuse. Well, did that abuse happen? Did it not happen? That's why I believe that police officer's testimony is gonna weigh in very, very heavily in the decisions that are being made in this case. Yeah, and, and CK, you know, uh, the jury is really delving into kind of what the law says here. In this case, we're talking about just the headline, not the entire op-ed is what the judge clarified. Um, but but some of the confusion seems to be that there's actually kind of, there are two different legal standards being applied here. What I mean by that is for, for defamation uh, on the whole in a civil case, we're talking about uh, the standard of having to prove it by preponderance of evidence. And it says so in the jury instruction, just prove by the greater weight of the evidence. But then you've got this actual malice element thrown in there because we're talking about a public figure. And in that case, I guess for that particular element, uh, that has to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. So what exactly does that mean? And how does the jury make sense of all this legalese? Well, it, it, it all boils down to how the attorneys explained it. And I think the attorneys explained it fairly well. And, I, and, I've, and it is confusing, I've litigated these First Amendment, case, Amendment cases. So the greater weight of the evidence, I always like to equate it to the scales of justice, which I've said here on Core TV before. The scales of justice have to be ever so slightly tipped, a mustard seed could do that, for one party or the other to prevail. Slightly tipping those scales of justice. So that's the one standard, and that's for defamation. Truth is an absolute defense to defamation. So that's how they're gonna look at the actual defamatory words. But then, because he's a public figure, because she's a public figure, the question is going to be, did Amber act with absolute, with, with malice? And the malice standard is what is much higher. Clear and convincing evidence, we're not looking at the preponderance, we're not looking at the, the uh, mustard seed, we're looking at a much higher level. Clear and convincing is not, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard, but it's somewhere in between. And so I think there's gonna be evidence in this case that there was clear and convincing evidence that Amber Heard knew exactly the ramifications, knew what she was saying. She had an opportunity to refute the headline. She had the opportunity to ask for a correction. She did none of the above, but instead she milked the narrative to her advantage. That's the that's the evidence in this case. So I believe that there's enough evidence to reach that malice, to reach the clear and convincing standard of proof. Um, and that is only because again, we're talking about public figures. She actually had to, with malice, she'd have to have intended that. So it is confusing, but the lawyers, 
They, they explained it pretty well, but it's on the lawyers to explain to the jury what is meant by that. The judge gives the jury instructions, but I know in closing, I always explain to the jury, what does it mean? Especially when it's confusing, because I wanted to give those jurors a way to give me my verdict. I'm a plaintiff's lawyer, so I wanted to give me my verdict. So <laughs> that's the best way, Joy, that I can explain it. Yeah, no, and it, it is complicated, but I think you, you know, you've done a good job of kind of presenting it to the layperson. So it's uh, essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you, they have to show that it's more likely and not than not that Amber Heard defamed Johnny Depp and they have to show, uh, well, it's pretty darn certain she did it with, with malice. That's correct. Okay. Good way of summarizing it. <laughs> Maybe over summarizing it, oversimplifying it. But thank you so much, C.K. Hoffler and uh, Mark Powell, for your insight and analysis. All right. Still with us, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta, former police officer, law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. Um, Mark, let's start with you this time. Uh, that testimony by Kate, we should say, was a little bit unexpected, and it's something that that Amber Heard essentially opened the door to with her own testimony. How impactful do you think? that was. Now that was very powerful because what they're doing is trying to show a pattern. In typical domestic abuse cases, you, it, it's not just one single incident. This is ongoing, it's pervasive. Sometimes it starts even as early as high school with teen dating violence. You'll see this pattern of behavior occurring in uh, typically young males uh, in, their, in their teens where they're abusing their girlfriends. There were several cases that were natural cases where you know, Teens, it started in, in, in school and then it, it transcends into adult life. So I think that Kate Moss's testimony stating that he never hit her, he did not push her down the stairs, is it's very good for the dev team because it shows that there is has not been a pattern of abusive behavior. Yet we also need to know this is not a criminal case. This is a civil case. And as CK said, there is a preponderance of the evidence. It's not a reasonable doubt. So if they can tilt that scale just a little bit and show that, yeah, well, even though he didn't abuse Kate Moss, it doesn't mean that he did not abuse Amber Heard. So it's going to be very tight for the jury to make this determination. They've got a lot of, lot of evidence to consider and they have a lot of testimony. But Kate Moss's testimony, very powerful, very powerful. CK, so you know, there was a star studded witness list, uh, Elon Musk, uh, James Franco, Paul Bettany, the British actor. I mean, these were all potential witnesses um, that, you know, we anticipated could possibly take the stand. Ultimately, we, we didn't anticipate Kate Moss because, uh, well, Amber Heard opened the door to it herself. That was kind of, you know, we saw the look on, on the faces of Johnny Depp and his team when she brought that up and kind of opened the door for them. Um, why did we not hear from the others and, and explain if you if you will for for our audience how it is that uh, Depp's team was able to bring in Kate Moss well certainly well Depp's team Kate Moss was was if they could bring her on it in at all she would be a rebuttal witness meaning to refute the allegations by Amber Heard's team but Amber Heard, there must have been some motions in limine or some motions between the with both sides with the judge as it relates to this testimony or potential testimony of rebuttal witnesses, because you've got to disclose your rebuttal witnesses. When Amber Heard opened the door and said that, and they must have known that there was a strong likelihood she would do that because she must have said that someplace else to friends or publicly somewhere. When she opened the door, that was an excellent opportunity to get in evidence and to show that she was lying yet again, because that's the significance of Kate Moss's testimony. It demonstrates that Amber was lying or she was fabricating in her own mind consistent with the testimony of Johnny Depp's um, psychiatrist. Their, their experts saying that she has you know, a personality disorder, all of these types of things, and she tends to exaggerate and fabricate information. This is an example. She took something that she thought she heard somewhere, and she said she was thinking about it in the back of her mind when she was engaged in this altercation with Johnny. But the way she said it was this, as if it actually happened, if Johnny actually pushed Case, Kate Moss down the stairs. So when they brought Case Moss on, and think about this, a former girlfriend that broke up with him, it would be easy for her to say, if it were true, yeah, he hit me. 
It really would have been easy for her to say that if it were true. And there would not have been any negative potentially consequences if it were true. But Kate Moss explained it, it was short, sweet to the point. But most importantly, as a trial lawyer, Amber Heard's team did not cross examine her. And why? Because they thought that the damage that she did was so severe that they didn't want to make it worse because it was very clear from her testimony, she was sticking to her story and it sounded credible. So I think Kate Moss was definitely an important witness for Johnny Depp. I think that she came in only as a rebuttal witness to refute a statement that Amber made that was a critical statement because Amber said in her mind and her psyche, she was thinking of Kate Moss and Johnny Depp pushing Kate down the stairs right there. That was potentially another defamatory statement right there in front of the jury. And so they were able to disprove that and to once again show Amber Heard is a liar. She lied to you, she lied to the police, she lied to everyone. And if she lied about this, she's gonna lie about everything and you need to not take, you need to understand that that article, the implication and everything was a big lie consistent with this lie. And so I think it was a great day for Johnny Depp. Mm, and just a tidbit for our viewers, by the way, Kate Moss was reportedly at Johnny Depp's concert in the UK last night, um, so interesting there. Um, but thank you so much, CK Hoffler and Mark Powell for joining us. Okay, let's bring back in our guest analyst for this hour, once again, trial attorney CK Hoffler in Atlanta, former police officer and law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. So CK, what we're hearing from Whitney, the sister of Amber Heard, is very different. Um, uh, you know, it, it possibly could be consistent, but it certainly is a different tone than what we heard from Kate Moss. What do you think? Absolutely, I think it, it is different. Uh, to be candid with you, I think Whitney, um, I when I first heard her testimony, I was moved by it because I felt that, um, you know, she was pretty specific about what happened. It seemed feasible, but I did also there were a few inconsistencies because Johnny had one version, Amber had another version. Whitney had another version of what happened. I think Isaac testified to it. There are four or five different versions of what happened. And there are two people that say that Johnny didn't hit Amber. And then Amber and her sister say that Johnny did hit Amber and hit her sister. So it's not so it's very difficult to, to say what actually happened. And I think the confusion or the inconsistencies will cancel out. Um, with the jury because it's it's just a confusing mess. But what is consistent, every single person says, is that Amber did strike Johnny. That's the only thing, that's the only truth that each of the witnesses, including Amber and Johnny, speak to. All the rest, massive confusion. Um, there was also some uh, testimony from a woman named Jennifer Howell who uh, had been the employer of Whitney. And she describes kind of an email that she sent to Whitney urging her to do the right thing. Let's listen to that. This is an email, Ms. Howell, that you sent to Whitney Henriquez on or about Tuesday, July 28th, 2020 at 11.20, excuse me, at 11.02 a.m. It is. This is a true and accurate copy of an email exchange that you sent to Ms. Enriquez? Yes, I believe I'm the one who gave that. Yes, it is. And then did you forward this email exchange and the attachments to Marcel Parasau? Yeah, I asked him to keep it for me. Why did you send this email and letter to Ms. Enriquez? because I've struggled very much with what to do in a situation that I love someone who I know is doing something very wrong and I know that they're doing it because they're trying to protect their sister and I'm trying to protect her and I'm just trying to get her to wake up and do the right thing, which is tell the truth. It's the only thing that can help everybody involved in this case. Okay, so what's your take on that, on that testimony, what you just heard as compared to what we heard um, from Whitney? Mark, what do you think? Well, um, what I'm thinking is that uh, when, when you get a witness up there and everybody who has to be a witness is under oath, so it makes it very challenging for witnesses because witnesses can be subject to perjury. If they don't tell the truth, they can also be prosecuted 
for lying in court. It makes it very challenging. So if you see what the testimony that she did put out there, if it's accurate, then that's great. If it's not accurate, then she could be in a, in big in big trouble. But you also know that when in law enforcement, when you're interviewing multiple witnesses, let's say at the scene of an accident, you have four witnesses, you might get four completely different stories. How people see it oftentimes is very different. So right here, you have one person, well, everybody's saying that Amber struck Johnny. And then it's kind of mixed a little bit of what happened after that. Did he in fact grab her? Did he in fact beat her? As, as the witness was saying, as Whitney was saying, um, we, we don't know we weren't there. But like I said, when you have multiple witnesses, you're gonna get multiple different stories. And I think uh, CK is right, this might just cancel out uh, for the jury. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, and, and you sharing that uh, perspective about different individuals having different perspectives of the same incident, and it's something that happens in, in life. Um, CK, I, I want to ask you, just piggybacking off that, uh, about the issue of credibility. And for a jury, you know, is it really just about telling the truth, or is it also about being able to trust that person's perception of what actually happened? I think it's all of the above. The reason why I say that is people, the jurors are expecting and pray that the witnesses coming into the courtroom would tell the truth because there is a penalty of perjury. However, they know because the sensationalism, the sensationalism of a lot of trials, they know that people do come into the courtroom and, and lie or, or don't quite tell the truth or they tell their truth. But I do think for them, it's gonna boil down to, do they believe Amber? Do they believe Whitney? I think if they don't believe Amber, they're not going to believe her sister. For one, there is evidence now that is saying that maybe her sister was exaggerating or not telling the truth. And because she's her sister, there is a built-in bias, at least that's going to be the perception. But the jurors, as bad as Johnny Depp's behavior was at throwing things, at doing drugs, at being an alcoholic, at being erratic, and having a toxic relationship, I don't think there's sufficient credible evidence that he beat Amber. Was he a bad person? Did he have a toxic relationship? Did he do bad things? Is he this sort of out of sight type of actor, earthy crunchy type of person and maybe the jury doesn't agree with? Possibly, but the issue in this case is did he beat Amber? And I think this scene with all the 55 different versions, well actually five different versions, and Amber and her sister at the center on one side and all these other people on the other side, and Amber and everybody admitting that Amber's the one that hit Johnny, I think it's going to cancel out, it will be neutralized, and the jury's going to have to really go through with painstaking detail what happened, all the testimony. I think at the end of the day, they're going to say, I don't know what happened, but there's not enough evidence to pin it on Johnny and to say that Johnny is the one that beat Amber in that way, the way that Whitney said and the way that Amber said. And by the way, Whitney and Amber's stories aren't exactly in sync either. Mm, excellent point. Thank you so much, C.K. Hoffler and Mark Powell, for your insight and analysis. So with us, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in Atlanta former police officer and law enforcement analyst Mark Powell in San Diego, California. Um, so obviously this testimony is about uh, what has been called the Hicksville incident. Um, how important what was this testimony to the overall case, CK? I think it was important, but not terribly important. I think um, it was, again, you've got a he said, she said, type of a scenario. And then you've got a witness that said if anyone was acting crazy, it was Amber. So I think that this is not terribly critical. It was designed to be um, evidence of another, just yet another example of Johnny's volatile nature and his violence. But I don't think ultimately it panned out that way. And then, and in fact, the witnesses come forward, this this gentleman to say if anyone was acting crazy, and it's via, via you know social media, it was Amber. And he's refuting Amber's recitation of the facts. So I think, on balance, it's not the most important event. For yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the defense had uh, had a witness that they called um, Raquel Pennington, who was the former best friend of Amber Heard, and she actually confirms a story about um, Depp getting kind of irrationally angry about another woman. Let's listen to that. We were sitting around the campfire. I don't remember who the larger group was, and. Uh, Amber and Kelly Sue were sitting on a chair together, hugging, and um, Johnny came up and 
said, get your hands off my woman. And it was surprising because it was a very benign two friends sitting on the same chair hanging out and it was also surprising because Johnny had been hanging out with everybody um, in a friendly way and uh, a switch flipped when that happened and um, Amber got up went to go comfort Johnny and then, um, and then they went back to their trailer. And, and Ms. Pennington also testified that the alleged um, physical abuse became more evident during the course of their relationship. And at one point, she actually started to fear for Amber Heard's safety quite a bit. Um, Mark, do you think that that was compelling for the jury? Yeah, that was compelling, that, that testimony. However, inflection in a person's voice also means a lot. Like, get your hands off my woman versus get your hands off my woman. It could have been said in jest, but the first, uh, the, the young man, the gentleman who spoke, who runs the trailer park, who said he saw Johnny Depp being afraid of Amber Heard, speaks to a much broader picture of domestic violence and domestic violence against men, because that's oftentimes not reported. When the woman is the assailant against the, the man, um, sometimes there's some hesitation on the male reporting that to police for a multitude of reasons. Your your girlfriend is beating you up, your wife is beating you up, you know, man up, that kind of thing. So what we're seeing is why would Johnny Depp be afraid of Amber Heard unless maybe there's some history there of abuse that's been going on and it's pervasive. And those trailers are really small. If you've ever been in one of those small trailers, breaking off a light switch could have been done just by bumping into it or a light fixture just by bumping into it. Uh, if he wanted to thrash the trailer, there would have been probably a lot more damage in that trailer. That's a fair point. Thank you so much for your insight and analysis. Mark Powell and CK Hoffler.